Yeah, so uh, welcome everybody to the fourth version of the Transnational Feminist Dialogues organized by the Margarita von Brentano Center for Gender Studies at Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, my name is Sabina Garcia Peta, and I'm happy to welcome all of you to the third and last session of the, this new edition. Uh, where we have been focusing on the realities of conflicts, uh, militarization and struggles for social justice, equality and peace that take place in different countries and regions from a gender and feminist perspective. Uh, for this new edition under the title Transnational Feminist Dialogues on Gender, Conflicts and Social Justice, we have invited different experts to convene and collaborate in the conceptualization of different sessions. In today's session, under the topic uh, Resistance, Activist Practices and Social Movements, uh, the aim is to jointly, jointly discuss the understandings of those practices that, ru that run between everyday resistance and more organized forms uh, of collective action in which protesters gather in broader social or political movements to challenge authorities or hegemonic powers in national or transnational realms. In this event, we want to revisit those questions that inspired the series to ask about the actors that engage in resisting agri-food, environmental and climate conflicts and the strategies used by them, but also about the complexities and particularities of the resulting activist practices from a gender-based perspective in different contexts. Today's session um, is convened by the Junior Research Group Food for Justice, Power, Politics and Food Inequalities in Bioeconomy, funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, uh, led by Renata Mota at the Latin America Institute of Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, unfortunately, Renata will not be able to join us today for personal reasons. This is why Marco Teixeira, who is co-leader of the project, will assume the moderation. I want to thank uh, Marco for assuming uh, this role today and for conceptualizing today's session with us. Um, I'm accompanied not only by Marco Teixeira, but also by three wonderful panelists. So please uh, let me introduce all of our guests today. Um, Marco Antonio Teixeira is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Latin American Studies at the Freie Universität Berlin, and as I said, co-leader of the research group Food for Justice. Um, he received his PhD in sociology from the Universidad do Estado do Rio de Janeiro in 2018. And his research interests include social movement, food, food studies, gender studies, rural sociology, social inequalities, human rights and environment. We have also today here uh, Janet Conway who is a full professor of sociology at Brock University in Canada, where she held the Canada Research Chair in so Social Justice between 2008 and 2018, and was founder and director of the Social Justice Research Institute. She held the Nancy Rowell Jackman Chair in Women's Studies at Mount St. Vincent University, uh, her transdisciplinary research has centered on transnational social justice movements under conditions of globalization, notably transnational feminist, peace and indigenous peoples organizing, and their significance for social innovation, political thought, and democratic life in the face of contemporary crisis. Her work has been published in English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, German, and Italian. She's author of more than 50 published works, including Edges of Global Justice, uh, published by Rutledge in 2013. And her current research focuses on the gender, polit uh, uh, is on the gender politics of the resurgent right in Canada and worldwide, and its entanglements with and challenges to a feminist societal project for intersectional gender justice. Um, 
I also welcome uh, Sabrina Fernandez, who is a Brazilian sociologist and eco-socialist organizer. She's currently a postdoctoral fellow with the International Research Group on Autoritarianism and Counter Strategies of the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Stiftung, and a guest researcher with the Food for Justice uh, Group at FU Berlin. Sabrina is also contributing editor at Jacobin uh, magazine and was editor in chief of Jacobin Brazil. She's the founder and producer of uh, TC11, Brazil's major eco socialist online communications project and a member of the steering committee of the global eco socialist network. She's the author of the uh, books uh, Sintomas Morbidos 2019 and Sekiser Mudar uh, o Mundo. 2020, as well as various other articles and chapters in English, Spanish, and other languages. Last but, uh, but not least, uh, Camila Poncelara is a postdoctoral researcher at the Philips University of Marburg in Germany uh, at the Extractivism Project. She holds a PhD in sociology at the, at the um, School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris and a master's degree in comparative politics in Latin America from Science Po Paris. She made a, a postdoctoral stay at Universidad de Costa Rica and um, uh, Université Catholique de Louvain and has been professor and researcher at Universidad Central de Chile and Universidad Católica Silva Enriquez also in Chile. Furthermore, she's part of the board committee of the Research Committee on Social Classes and Social Movements of the International Sociological Association and the GT of Childhood and uh, Youth of Claxo. Um, before giving the word to Marco, I would like to give you some insight about today's program and some technical details. Uh, the session is organized in three parts. Uh, the discussion will start with a short introduction, uh, introduction from Marco framing remarks on the overall topic of the, today's panels and its relevance in light of contemporary events and trends in studies about resistance, activism, praxis, practices and social movements. After that, our panelists will have the opportunity to respond a uh, three round of questions. And the rest of the session will be dedicated to a Q&A and an open discussion with the audience. So please note that during the session, a cameras and microphones will remain off. Uh, you can write your questions throughout the presentation in the chat. And we would kindly ask you to try to make general questions to be answered by all of our guests. Um, for your information, today's session is being recorded and we will make it available through the Margarita von Brentano Center YouTube channel uh, in a couple of days. So, Marco, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Sabina. Uh, good afternoon for everyone who joined us here today. Um, and thank you, Sabina, for being a great partner in the organization of this session. Thank you, Camila, Janet, and Sabrina for joining us here today. Um, as you know, I will have a different role today. I will take over Renata's role and I will moderate this panel. And more than a moderation, I will try to engage in this conversation uh, that we will have today, connecting the research we have been doing in Food for Justice with the presentations today. So, I hope we can enjoy this format that focuses more on the conversation than on, than a traditional presentation to engage all of us in this debate. And for that, I invite uh, all of the participants and the, uh, and the speakers to think of comments and questions that can be posed in the next two hours we will be together. And uh, before I start in the presentations, I wanted to briefly present to you the research group Food for Justice and explain why we are having this conversation today. Um, Food for Justice, uh, as uh, Sabina said, is a research group based at the Freie Universität Berlin that aims, let's say, to study struggles for food justice. Uh, the project started in April 2019 and it's funded for five years by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And our main question is, 
what projects of social change are aspired for or are already on the way towards a society that fosters ecological, just, just and democratic food politics. Food politics refers to the power relations, asymmetries, and disputes that are embedded in practices of producing, distributing, preparing, consuming, and wasting food. There are a lot of contributions from stakeholders, such as state parties, uh, international organizations, companies, uh, to the discussion of food politics. Each of them tries to impose their agenda and influence the politics of food. In Food for Justice, we are interested in analyzing and highlighting the contribution of popular social movements and initiatives. We consider what we call food movements, an analytical category, as a privileged instance to look at social change from below. And for that, the role of feminism is central to our research group, both as theoretical approach as well as empirical source. As a theoretical approach, we take into consideration, for instance, the discussions around the division of labor that assign women to some kinds of work, and the intersectional approach, which, which helps us to, uh, to see and to show the differences and inequalities that exist between different categories of difference, such as class, gender, sexuality, and how they articulate and intersect. We have also been conducting research with and about feminists and women's movements, such as the Brazilian Marcha das Margaridas, the English uh, literal translation would be the Daisy's March, a mobilization of rural women or women from the lands, from the forests and the waters, as they, as they call themselves. We also have uh, case studies with women's farms in Germany, agricultural movements in Brazil and some others. And we conduct empirical research in two world regions, as I just mentioned, like Europe, which are focused on Germany and Latin America, mainly in Brazil, but also now we have a research case in Chile. For that, we have a team of postdoctoral, doctoral and master researchers, and we collaborate with many scholars worldwide. So through the discussions over food politics, we aim to engage in a broader sociological discussion of socio-ecological transformations, inequalities, feminisms, post-colonialisms, and social mobilizations. That said, I wanted to use some minutes just to, to explain why, were we, why are we engaging in this conversation here today? Why do you think it makes sense to have Camila, Janet, Sabrina, and us together to discuss resistance activists, activisms, social movements from a feminist perspective. When we talk about food politics and the struggles for food justice, we cannot forget that this topic, this topic intersects with many others, such as the struggles for climate justice and the fights against extractive projects, for, for instance. How can we talk about food production without considering the effects of climate change worldwide, or the impact of mining projects in the Amazon biome, for example, in evicting small family farmers and traditional populations from the land they have been living in for decades or even centuries. Uh, these struggles have been, uh, they have people behind them, or better saying, uh, those struggles have political subjects. A particularly uh, important one is women, they are peasants, small farmers, indigenous, quilombolas, extractive workers, fisherwomen, coconut breakers, and many others. They are racialized, they live in different places, and know of that impact how they influence politics and how they are affected by injustice as well. They are leaders of struggles for, for social justice, but also they have, in many cases, less recognition than men for the work they do. So how can we shed light on feminists and women's struggles in resisting agri-food, environmental and climate conflicts? How are those struggles interrelated? That's why we have these fantastic speakers today, 
And as we said, uh, our idea is to have a conversation in which we can focus on the intersection of resistance, activism, social movements, and feminism. So that said, let's move forward to hear our speakers today. Uh, we will have a format that we will, uh, I will pose, I will ask three questions. I will start with the first question and each of our speakers will have a chance to, to answer, to comment uh, each of these questions. And for this first question, I would suggest that we could start with Camila, followed by Janet and then Sabrina. And the second and third questions, we can change the, the order. So for the first question, uh, the first question is, uh, which activism do you study? Do you consider themselves feminists or allies to feminism? How do you materialize this perspective in your research agenda? The idea here is to, uh, to know, to, to get to know a little bit of the research case that you have been focused on, more on an empirical level. So uh, the floor is yours, Camila. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thanks to Marco and also to Sabina, to Renata, um, and also to all the center, right? Um, I'm really happy to be here with you uh, today. So uh, the question is really interesting. Um, it's not easy to, to say yeah, because there are so many things that we can talk today. But um, yeah, I would like to explain a little bit my research. The last few years I have been working in the anti-extractivism agenda more deeply, right? Um, so I have been, but at the beginning I have been studying activists uh, who are part of the social, social movements in Latin America uh, for example, in Chile, the case of Chile, of course, because I'm, I'm from there, but also Costa Rica, Honduras, and Egypt. Uh, the central element that closed them is their form of, of activism and organizations beyond the reference country, right? Uh, student movements, in this case, feminist students' movements, and also anti-extractivism movements, right? Uh, all, of, all of these are, are framing the new definition uh, where traditional categories are not longer necessary to respond to them or their activists. Uh, this is very important to, to clarify. Uh, they respond an, to a new wave of movement, according, for example, according to ju uh, juries. Um, they will be the new, new social movements um, because they would like to go a little bit beyond the category of the new social movement elaborated by Touraine or prior to it, uh, that of class struggle, right? Uh, so we are always thinking of theories that put the actor in the center. This is for me, is very, very, very uh, important. Uh, also, uh, for example, there, we have also the case of other um, sociologists, for example, Castells, who talks about the, this Facebook movements and also the movement uh, without leaders. This is also an important point. Uh, Breno Bringel in Brazil, for example, he, he calls it a new period that opens in the 2011 with uh, the Arab Spring, Los Indignados in Madrid, or Gezi, Gezi Park in Istanbul. Uh, also, we have players, uh, um, Joffre Players himself calls it square movements or movimientos de plazas. Uh, these activists are, are uh, that it, I mentioned, they are not only feminists, of course, they are also particularly young people who want to transform, who wants, they want to change the world, or at least the world around themselves. Of course, there are feminists and environmentalists that they seek, they seek to transform the economy, the social and the political model as well as the patriarchy, right? Indeed, um, there is not a form of feminism, not a form of uh, youth, but a plurality of them. This is, this is uh, important also uh, for me. So as, as, I, was, uh, as uh, I was saying before, the, the point of the destructivism is very important for my agenda uh, right now, because also it's related to, to feminism and how is this is affecting the different communities in Latin America and also the Maghreb region. Uh, from my perspective, uh, no one 
I mean, the most important that I have been um, researching, working on, is the case of Ventanas in uh, Ventanas Quintero, that we call the Chilean Chernobyl uh, because of the natural and social and economic disaster uh, that uh, has meant for the communities and the residents from these sacrifice sacrifice zones. Tell me with the, the, the timing because I don't know if I'm talking that long. It is fine. Okay, good. So uh, here we can see, for example, the intersections, uh, different kind of types of activists uh, from social organizations to artivists, people who are artists as well, uh, that they, they play also a crucial role. Uh, so they, they, they're able to, to give visibility and empower these communities. This is also a, a, a crucial role. So, um, for example, this also these women's organizations make make also to, um, the, the possibility to create networks of solidarity that goes far beyond national borders or feminism itself, right? Um, on the other hand, we have also uh, young activists who participate in mobilizations from the students uh, to those present in the social outbreak in, in Chile that it was very famous. Um, so in these projects, I have focused mainly on knowing their trajectories, their political subject, subjectivities and form, forms of actions where I highlight performs and the use of the body. Yes, this is also um, a point. And also I try to articulate the intersect uh, and intersect the militantism and the activism. This is also a, a link an important link. And what kind of changes we are seeing and how can we understand better those new new actors, actors who seem outsiders or in the borders. Um, also, I want to link these mobilizations with others such as the Me Too, the most famous one, of course, in the medias, but also uh, we have other more relevant in Latin America, for example, the New Namenos, or, or we can translate it like, like uh, no one less that cross many Latin American countries, for example, Argentina, Chile, Mexico, Colombia, Costa Rica, many others, Peru as well. Or oh, the Elenao, I don't know if I'm, I'm saying it right <laughs> because there are many Brazilians today. Yeah, uh, against Bolsonaro in Brazil, right? Uh, or Ballons ton Port in, in, in France. So um, there are so many others um, um, like uh, mobilizations that we are not seeing, right? Uh, this is important to, uh, why for me it's important to connect all these mobilizations. Um, so also in others, uh, just to, to finish, in, in other publications, papers, I, I have tried to also to link the feminist waves, you know, because all the literature are talking about these waves um, which represent this, the history of these social movements uh, with the current moment, even if there are some interesting research talking about the new waves um, in the social in the global south. Uh, thanks to post-colonial theories, we have more tools to rethink this problematic. So for me, it's more important just to say we have this new wave. Uh, we have also other other things to to point out and also to understand um, in many cases the demands of, of the past waves and that we are seeing again and again because the, the history is not linear, right? So this is also a point. So I think I, I said everything more or less because there are many things to say. Yes. Thank you very much, Camila, for your first inputs. Uh, now, please, Janet, the floor is yours. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for um, this uh, great event. I'm really inspired by the questions, and I like the format a lot and looking forward to the exchange. Uh, and I'm very honored to be uh, on the panel with these other great activist scholars. Um, so the, this first question um, about what which activisms do I study? Do they consider themselves feminist? or as allies to feminism, and how does this materialize in my research? 
This is a really interesting question. So just to say that, um, you know, over a 20 year academic um, trajectory, studying social movements, studying activisms, uh, you know, I've, I've worked on a variety uh, of, of social justice movements from starting uh, from the 1990s um, uh, with an urban anti-poverty and economic justice network uh, in Toronto, then the anti-globalization uh, demonstrations in Canada, the Jubilee movement, the anti-debt movement um, that was heavily um, organized in the global south, and then starting in the 2000s, the World Social Forum process, um, and um, the uh, at the global level and also at the hemispheric level in the Americas, then the World March of Women, which is this big transnational feminist network, also uh, present on every continent, um, but heavily uh, represented in Latin America. And, um, and important for this conversation, uh, indigenous movements in the Americas in relation to the social forum process, but also indigenous mobilizations in Canada for indigenous sovereignty, uh, for land reclamation, and uh, for the defense of land and water. Um, against uh, extractivist and development projects. So, you know, over that long period of time, of course, um, there's a huge array of positionalities vis-a-vis -vis feminism. Um, but first to say that most of these movements that I have engaged with are mixed gender movements. They're not women's movements, they're mixed gender movements. And, um, but all of them uh, include women prominently in their demographic. Uh, and as, often as leaders in the movement. Feminism is an important political current that runs through all these movements. Nominally, um, practically all of these social justice movements would say that they are aligned with feminism or they're pro-feminist. But I would say that um, there's a huge array, you know, of um, actually feminist politics in these movements or lack thereof. And there are significant tensions in these movements around feminism. So, for example, in the World Social Forum process, um, you know, there's a kind of nominal um, agreement or endorsement of feminism as one of the movement of movements. Um, and there's um, uh, there's certainly a lot of women present there, but there are also a lot of tensions around the male dominance of the space. Uh, the real fight that women have had to conduct for visibility and for leadership and for acknowledgement. There are ongoing problems with sexual harassment and sexual violence in spaces like this. Um, and there's a real struggle to have feminism as a body of knowledge acknowledged as having something important to say for radical politics. And, you know, I think this is an ongoing struggle in a lot of mixed gender movements of all kinds, and especially those on the left. Uh, so this is something that perhaps that, you know, we could discuss more among us or in the chat, but to say that, um, you know, feminism uh, is present, it's acknowledged, but there's a huge range between a kind of nominal acknowledgement uh, that doesn't necessarily mean any kind of deep engagement with feminism and how feminisms of different kinds, because they don't all agree either, but how feminisms of different kinds actually challenge the politics of mixed gender movements. So that's the, the first big thing I want to say. The second thing is that um, in my studies of the World March of Women, which is a you know, uh, self-identified feminist network, it's the largest transnational feminist network in the world, it is explicitly feminist. But very important and, and kind of central to its feminist politics is that it seeks to organize subalternized women women who are poor and economically marginal. And it recognizes that many such women do not identify as feminist. Uh, in fact, they might actively uh, reject that label because they identify feminism as a movement of middle-class educated women that have not historically paid attention to their concerns. And their concerns uh, more often are around um, land, water, food, work, nutrition, health, not necessarily around the gender first politics of many um, feminisms. And so many of those subalternized women do not identify as feminist. The World March of Women has made a real point in its mobilization of these women to say that, to, to not demand that they identify as feminist. 
the World March of Women um, considers that they themselves are feminists and they are actively involved in building feminism and building feminism as an open-ended construction in dialogue with the women that they seek to mobilize. So that's a very, very important kind of feminist practice that works with this real tension around what do we consider feminism, its historical legacies and baggage, and the difficulties that a lot of subalternized populations have um, with, their, with their, what they perceive to be feminism. Um, and the last thing to say on this, at least for the moment, is that um, this is also especially important when we think about Indigenous uh, mobilizations. Because um, Indigenous women, like many other racialized women, also do not identify as feminist because they associate feminism with the politics of the racial majority or white in, in the Americas with white women. And so they actively reject the label feminist. Nevertheless, they are mobilizing as women in their communities for what they regard as their rightful and traditional roles as leaders. And um, they are also on the front lines of land and water defense struggles. And um, so as, and I'm a self-identified feminist, you know, as a scholar and as an activist, but in interacting with these um, activisms, to me, it's extremely important to put aside the question of feminist identity, to simply say that as a feminist, it's important to me politically to support the movements for life and to support the movements for indigenous survival, for example and to support the women in those movements in, in whatever ways that they consider important uh, for the role that they play in those movements and for the survival of their peoples. And that's, um, you know, that raises difficult questions uh, around what we mean by feminism and what the meaning of these activisms are uh, for feminism. So the question that, that the organizers have posed around, do they consider themselves feminist? or allies to feminism, there's another category here to consider, and that is like hostile to feminism <laughs> or uh, alienated by feminism. And therefore, how do feminists position themselves vis-a-vis -vis those movements? Um, so, you know, there are interesting and important things to think about there. And about the, um, so on one hand, it's the question of the relationship of feminism and feminist politics to subalternized populations, to racialized populations, but also to movements and peoples like Indigenous peoples who are, who testify to and whose politics are organized around alternative cosmologies. And um, it requires recognizing the specificity of feminism as a political tradition. And, um, and for example, it's interpolation with liberal modernity and that this puts it in tension with indigenous movements, with many indigenous movements. And um, it requires, I think, a feminist that we recognize that feminism, as committed to it as we are, is also arising out of a, out of a specific kind of world. Um, so in terms of um, how do these kinds of insights materialize in my own research agenda. I'll say more about this in, in the subsequent questions, but um, that it's important to me to always to enter these research relationships being explicit about my feminism, but also recognizing that feminism is one positionality and that um, in my view, a feminist societal project for intersectional social justice uh, means being open to how these movements are understanding themselves in terms that may not be mine. And to me, this is part of an ongoing challenge for you know, emancipatory movements of all kinds, but including feminisms. So I'll just leave it there for the moment. Thank you very much, Janet, for your very inspiring inputs. And now I won't say much further now, I will say for later, uh, Sabrina, it's your turn. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, uh, Sabina, as well, for the support today. Uh, nice to see you, Janet and, and Camila. Um, well, 
So the projects uh, and like what I study is like a, a myriad of projects, campaigns, organizations, and networks. And my main focus is on trying to figure out how, how they converge. What are the agendas? There are common agendas to these movements in terms of ecological issues. So I find that looking into Latin America and here, I think uh, there are some things that I can bring in that I think are similar to what Camila has found, but also similar to what Janet has found, is that there are certain, uh, certain struggles that because they affect everyone uh, in such a powerful way. So in the case, like talking about the effect of a sacrifice zone in, a, in an extractivist project, or, um, and they do this in a way that they put a lot of the burden on women because they are required to deal with the issues at hand right away. So how do we find water and what do we do about the children who are getting ill and situations like that, often, these movements are confronted with the necessity to deal with feminism at some level. But there are conflicts around it and there is even some resistance. Some of it is connected to this idea that uh, feminism is something that's being imported from outside. So it doesn't really talk about our experiences or something perhaps identified as something academic or something that's out there in the media about um, you know, general women's empowerment, and sometimes that's even associated as something um, that could be negative because some of these movements on the ground who have been doing work around ecology are not really going through the theoretical formations on what happened with first wave, second wave feminism, especially when we're talking uh, in terms of like the global south where the history of the feminist debate is kind of different. So the conflicts are there, but that's, that's also led some of these groups to trying to theorize things in a different way in order to present their struggles and see how that works out. So what we find in terms of like the ecological agenda uh, per se, and in the case of Brazil, which is like where I focus most of my work, is that the authoritarian politics coming from the Bolsonaro government that's a very anti-ecological authoritarian politics. Uh, that's not just the deforestation of the Amazon, although this is what's most spoken about outside of Brazil because of the, the very relevance of the Amazon. But we're talking here about really enclosing into people's territory. We're talking about the privatization of life in so many ways, and that affects, for example, access to electricity, access to water, so many other issues, uh, a mix between climate denialism and trying to promote Brazil as like the, the advancement of the green economy, because then you can just put a, a price on carbon and then agribusiness can make more money. All of that situation ends up um, creating uh, a context that's also very misogynistic. And that comes not only from the, um, the things that Jair Bolsonaro says as president, but the politics that are being promoted through the government. So you, one very direct like empirical um, fact that we have here is that the minister for like women and human rights, so like Damaris Alves, who's very anti-feminist, uh, has a very strong agenda on indigenous assimilation. So, uh, you know, trying even like pursuing indigenous children, taking them away from their communities or bringing fundamentalist pastors into the indigenous communities um, uh, in order to, uh, what, what would, they, would they call, not, not only in terms of like assimilation, they would call it like integration in a way that, well, they have to become more civilized. So then we're repeating the colonial past in, uh, you know, like with a, a little bit of adjustment here and there. So it is required to talk about this level of misogyny that's been like coming from like a minister uh, of women who's very anti-feminist um, and who, for example, is directly engaged in taking away the rights of, you know, indigenous mothers uh, who may be losing their children and situations like that. So the perspective of understanding that there is a system of machismo, uh, so there is a system that's very sexist and that affects us all this is something had, that has really improved in the past years. The, on the other hand, understanding how we respond to this, what is the alternative to this, is still uh, an issue um, in many areas. We have found, um, however, for example, that uh, in the past years, and I think one of the um, 
uh, events that really helped to struggle, uh, to organize the struggle was the, um, the March of Indigenous Women that also uh, before the pandemic uh, converged with Marcha das Margaridas in Brazil as well. So like this alliance between peasant women and indigenous women, uh, this helped. And this situation led a lot of these indigenous women leaders to say, well, feminism could be something else. Maybe we might not call ourselves feminists. So like this is connected to uh, like this uh, conflict that Janet was talking about. And, but on the other hand, we understand that the way that things are right now is not working. Um, and the power of like these in women indigenous leaders in leading uh, the struggle for the territory has really brought a lot of attention. So in a way it has um, affected like strategically how the struggle over territory is perceived in a positive way. So having a lot of the women leaders. So uh, not only in the sense of getting like, um, you know, the, the only um, indigenous congresswoman that we have uh, is Joanna Wapishana. So like, uh, and she's the only indigenous congressperson, right? So also also a woman and some of the biggest leaders that we have are like Sonia Guajajara we could be talking about uh Sede Chakriaba we could be talking about um Kerishu. there's like many uh indigenous leaders to the point that now like there's an association of um indigenous women they are focused on trying to understand what this should look like so perhaps the uh name is not used directly but the politics are politics of em emancipation for women so when we bring this back to the material level, we find that the convergence is there, even though the perspective is, is itself might not be uh, might not be something that's very common to everyone. Uh, in addition to this, uh, there's been uh, more conversation around what ecofeminism would look like, and this is something very present in the climate movement itself. So understanding that. Uh, climate justice is a matter uh, that um, is in the interest of women because we know that a lot of the projects of adaptation that we are lacking right now, those are projects that if they're not done, women will care, carry more of the burden, uh, has led them to try to make these connections. So there's a, a, a pursuit right there. Um, also, it's something that's disputed because uh, you could have like ecofeminist perspective within the climate movement um, that's a lot more radical and some that try to negotiate more with, with the capitalist system. But this is something that's uh, currently under development. But one thing that we find is that once you go back to like this material issue itself, um, the claims of feminism, they become like easier to understand. And one something that came out in the research, like over the past year or so, is the issue of access to electricity, understanding in general in the world that we have about 800 million people who don't have proper access to electricity. So this is part of the, the demand for climate justice is to like get them electricity for the first time and make sure it comes from renewable sources. Um, understanding this is also understanding, for example, the impact of electrification the household in reducing the amount of hours that women uh, have to currently employ in terms of social, reproduct uh, social reproductive labor. So, you know, uh, if you're not having to find wood for the kitchen because you have an electrified stove, that that saves time and sometimes it even allows women to pursue uh like employment paid employment outside outside of the household as well so uh, once we go back to like these very particular situations uh it's allowing us to bring the feminist perspective even though sometimes it doesn't always uh, come through the same theoretical lens this is something that i find has helped to mediate some of this resistance within the like broader leftist movements um, in terms of like the, the male, the male gaze, the male authority, um, you know, and like uh, who are like the leaders who get more of the microphone time and things like that. Because uh, once we go back to the issues themselves, it becomes clear that's in the interest of others. So if this is going to help women, it might help, uh, it is going to help other, other people as well. But certainly the resistance is there. The part of the labor movement that we deal in terms of climate justice, this is more present because a lot of the unions that are considered to be strategic to talk about um, climate transition, 
from a, a climate change scenario into a renewable scenario or in terms of energy policy. Those are labor unions that are very concentrated uh, within sectors where you have a lot more uh, uh, men working than women working. So sometimes that affects the strategies of the labor movement in terms of unionization. So one of the main um, challenges that we have right now is really understanding that if we're talking about um, climate change as a class issue, the working class is very diverse and women uh, uh, should be considered part of this struggle in many different ways, not only when they're in the union within the oil sector or, you know, or they're like minors in terms of like lithium and cobalt. And I'm going to stop here for now. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much, Sabrina. Um, I won't try to, to summarize this first round. I think we had um, some very um, good uh, inputs and uh, a lot of food for thought, <laughs> if you allow me to use this metaphor. But one thing that caught my attention is like um, we were talking or you were talking about different actors um, uh, and for example, the indigenous populations and how, and, how, and how those actors, they have been challenging some uh, ideas of what we understand uh, by feminism and how some, um, and this is very interesting because it's like, it, this is in the ground, this is in the material level, this is in the everyday practice of uh, the social movements. But this is also bringing um, up some challenges for us as researchers. So that's maybe I would like to to hear more, like in, in the discussion. Not not now. I will ask a, a second question, but like how can we learn from them instead of uh, instead of imposing our categories as a normative categories? Of course, we will still deal with that. We have our categories, our normative categories. But how how can we put in dialogue those um, uh, those categories with uh, the everyday practice of those women that have been uh, putting in practice this uh, different kinds of feminisms. And if we compare those feminists that, that are uh, being uh, discussed in Latin America with the ones in Europe and North America, we will, uh, I think it gives us more food for thought to, to, to go further, to, to understand how can we build up uh, social justice uh, across difference as well. And also what I wanted to say is to call attention to to the context of struggles, that's somehow what, what, what I understood uh, from your different perspectives and something that also caught my attention was like, Camila was talking about uh, many different actors that uh, have been in the spotlight in Chile and everybody's kind of look at Chile nowadays because of the, the importance of the feminism struggles there. I was also wondering how these uh, new namenos or all those struggles in Chile uh, have been informing or being informed or have been in relation to the anti-extractivist struggles, for example. Is there any dialogue between them? So just to to uh, we also we are also being facing those uh, questions in food for justice, in the case of Marcha das Margaridas. So I think there are a lot that we can talk about, but uh, this more theoretical level of discussion, um, I think it, it will help us to move to the second question. Of course, this is related to the first question as well, but now I wanna ask you, how does a feminist theoretical perspective inform your research on social justice, environmental and extractivism struggles, climate struggles, you, maybe you could uh, elaborate uh, further also this question, how uh, you as researchers have been dealing um, with this difference between this more theoretical discussion of how feminists should look like and how feminist it is uh, materialized in the everyday practice. And for that, we would like to invite you, Janet, to, to talk first. Um, the floor okay. is yours. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, so um, well, this this actually what I was going to say uh, follows really nicely from your comments, Marco, because in terms of thinking about um, a feminist theoretical perspective in my work, I would say first and foremost that um, I consider it the, the starting point for my inquiry 
is to listen to the women and to the feminists in the practice that I am paying attention to. So before I decide anything, theoretically, I want to hear what they have to say about themselves and their own practices and their view of the world. Uh, and that, um, and, and really to allow that to lead me and to be an important um, reference point. And this to me is about treating social movements as knowledge producers rather than objectifying them, right? To, to treat them as knowledge producers, as sites that produce knowledge and that, that I as a researcher am in uh, dialogue with. And I have my own perspective and my own questions for sure, but that a very important starting point is to try to listen and understand the perspectives that are arising from the practice. And this includes the question around feminism. So it's because I'm a feminist and because I'm concerned about feminist questions and gender relations and the role of women, I wanna to listen to what they are saying and, and their take on things. Secondly, I wanna read what feminist scholars are saying on the subject. I wanna pay attention to whatever feminist knowledge is out there to help me understand the problem or the issue that the, that the movements themselves are confronting. And, and again, so, so in sum, I guess, what I wanna say first is that theoretically, I consider myself eclectic. <laughs> I, I wanna be open, I wanna be eclectic, I wanna be plural because, you know, reality is messier than theories, always. And reality is always throwing up things that theories haven't yet contemplated. And rather than be locked into certain theoretical commitments, I want to really pay attention. And this is partly, it's sort of my uh, orientation as an ethnographer. You know, I am a political scientist by PhD, but, but in terms of my sensibility, it's more ethnographic and inductive in that sense. Now, having said that, I also um, certainly bring my own sustained theoretical and political commitments to the work that I do. And again, these have over my, you know, now multi-decade um, kind of work doing this, um, you know, these have evolved historically, but I would say that I was really fundamentally formed by anti-racist feminism in Canada in the 1980s. Like this is foundational for me. And this was a kind of precursor to intersectionality, you know, before the term was coined, this conviction that uh, race, class and gender at a minimum, as a starting point, um, were intersecting, and that we had to pay attention to, to, to these three plus others always. And um, that I would say that over these decades that I have brought and continue to bring an intersectional sensibility. So not a fixed method, not a fixed uh, theory, but a sensibility around the multiplicity of oppressions, uh, the multiplicity of systems of power, and the need um, to pay attention to them. And in particular, you know, there, there is that um, attention to race, class, and gender as foundational, plus others. Um, in addition to that, I would say, again, I mean, this is going back to the 80s, but to my kind of first encounters with um, international political economy and, um, sort of studies of the third world and understanding globalization before the term was coined. And um, that has really led me to engage over a long period of time with transnational feminism as an analytic. So that um, stream of feminist thought, theory and practice that has, that has been informed by post-colonial and third world feminisms, their critique of Western feminisms and their insistence that um, the geopolitics of um, different contexts of struggle really matter in terms of understanding those struggles, understanding them in terms of world region, but in terms of um, the power relations in, um, in a world system, you know, in a capitalist world system and in a world system that has been in formation for 500 years. So profoundly shaped by, you know, colonial uh, relations. So transnational feminism as an analytic, um, very foundational. Um, its critique of uh, liberal modernity, I think, uh, has become very important to me. Um, and long-standing sort of um, critique of methodological nationalism and the importance of seeing any context in transnational context. So any context as formed through relations across time and space. 
and that we can't study context in a, in a close as closed containers. And, uh, and that goes for movements um, as well. And I think um, sort of, I think arising, especially from my engagement with indigenous movements and indigenous movements in the Americas um, is um, a critique of modernity uh, and coloniality and engagements with decolonial thought. And again, I mean, it's easy to say these things but it's very hard to actually um, hold these things together because they're somewhat incommensurable. Intersectionality, transnational feminism, decolonial thought, indigenous feminism, these are not, they don't fit easily together. There are some real contradictions and tensions among them. And, but to try to, to pay attention in a consistent way to the questions and the challenges they raise, um, this to me you know, is what I aim for um, theoretically in my work. Uh, and then the last sort of big thing I would say about theoretical orientations is um, an orientation to praxis. And that is that, uh, in my view, practice leads. That the profound questions of our time are going to be resolved in practice. They're not going to be resolved in theory. They're going to be resolved in practice. And so paying attention to the practices of collectivities that are trying to change the world in ways that we think it needs to be changed. This is a source, first and foremost, of knowledge and insight, but it's also the way we're going to figure out how to move forward. And that um, figuring out how to move forward can happen with all the contradictions and messiness of practice in a way that kind of is eludes, that, the, that elude, is elusive and, and eludes theory in that sense. Uh, in terms of um, the questions more specifically about our engagements with agri-food um, and ecological and climate movements. I would say that, um, <clears throat> for example, in studying the World March of Women, <clears throat> making sense of their practice, it became important to really recognize that they are, in, they are informed and inspired by Marxist feminism. Now, if that's not, uh, I'm not parked in that camp myself. But it, it's important for me as a researcher to engage in a serious way with what they, the activists, are saying and what they are informed by. And so they are using Marxist feminism to understand themselves as feminists and their feminist practice and also their engagement with food sovereignty and with pe uh, peasant movements and indigenous movements that they're trying to build an alternative politic around. And it was really only in coming to recognize that Marxist feminist genealogy of the World March, that a whole lot of things began to fall in place in terms of understanding them and understanding their practices and understanding the alternatives that they represent. So this is just a concrete example of paying attention to the discourses that are arising within the movements themselves, the theoretical discourses that may be more or less worked out, more or less um, systematic, often not systematic, but nevertheless are there and are informing um, the practice that's underway. Um, I and, and other colleagues, and including Marco and Renata, have um, been working with um, the genealogy of popular feminism in Latin America as a way of understanding the kind of feminism that we see on the ground in subalternized movements, including where people eschew the language of feminism. But that this tradition of popular feminism in Latin America has been very kind of helpful and fruitful in trying to see and describe and understand these feminisms, including um, it's rather tense and sometimes, um, well, uh, um, um, I was going to say kind of domineering, <laughs> but relationship with the left, you know, that in other words, Popular feminism, uh, the, pop, the feminism of these subalternized women has, has come into being in a conversation with feminist activists on the left who bring their own analytic frameworks. And that raises itself a conundrum around, you know, to what extent these frameworks are imposed and what extent um, they arise kind of endogenously, you know, from, as Sabrina was saying, the, the kind of material, the, the material struggles, you know. And this is, to me, a, a kind of ongoing question and an empirical question um, in terms of the different movements that we study. I think the last thing I'll say uh, on this question right now is that in terms of engaging with indigenous land and water protectors, um, 
that that is uh, to me it has required an, a deep engagement with indigenous knowledge uh, and with indigenous feminism, and these are again our knowledge traditions that are you know have been systematically um, rendered non-existent by modern knowledge systems. And so there is a huge intellectual task there to listen to that and to grow our literacy, grow our capacity to hear that and to be respectful of that and to find some kind of political practice that enables us, um, well, first and foremost, I think people like me, non-Indigenous people, to support those struggles for Indigenous survival, but then also to, to craft some kind of politics of alliance that um, does not flatten out difference. And I think this is a question, I guess, I would pose back to Sabrina around the search for convergence, because convergence can also flatten difference. And uh, in terms of the power relations between different movements, um, Indigenous difference can be erased, you know, in that kind of politic of convergence. Anyway, we can talk more about that, but uh, it's just something that I um, um, was kind of stimulated by in terms of your comments. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, I wanted to suggest, I will briefly comment, like, if you could write down the questions and the comments, we will have like less around that in which you can respond or comment. So just you can address in your own comments now, but like we will also have like a last round that you can um, comment like the questions. Because for for example, now I, I won't say for the the, the the closing of this second round, but like what, what Janet said, for example, about all those tensions between uh, transnational families, indigenous families, uh, the colonial families, and then how to put it everything together. And it was very inspiring to, to hear you and how you uh, deal with your empirical research or with your research. How do you do that? Because it's, I would say, like, it's quite different from the things that we hear at the university. Like, I would love that students could be here and then we could discuss that. Because one thing is that what we discuss in this, the methodological classes. But when we face the real world, I mean, when we go to to, to the ground and we do research with uh, the social movements and so on, the reality is a bit different. And for me, like, how do we, how can we put all of that together? Maybe we won't, but for me, like I was, I was thinking here, I wanted to embrace those tensions and those differences and to, to, to move forward. Just uh, one insight, and also for me, what is also like because Sabrina was bringing um, before the role of authoritarianisms and all the other hegemonic force, and you were suggesting that we should pay attention to the practices to figure out how to move forward. But like I was also wondering, how can we follow those practices? But taking, meanwhile, when we and also take into consideration all the other forces, the hegemonic force, because it's like it's it won't be enough just to practice to to figure, to, to follow the social movements and popular social movements and alternative um, practice to uh, to figure it out. Like I'm, I'm just trying to 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 bring into the discussion also those other actors. But the question uh, now, I will. Um, and to Sabrina, Sabrina, please, the floor is yours. Like we started the conversation, as you said, like it's a more fluid format. And yeah, that's it. Excellent. No, I actually want to start like well, the comment that Janet made, I think brings me to the things that I wanted to discuss uh, in answering this question anyway. So I think that's pretty good. Um, there's uh, sometimes in the movement, like especially like in the traditional left, there is a misunderstanding between convergence and forced consensus, right? So this idea that, um, well, we need to build unity because the left is very fragmented and there are so many demands that you raise some of demands in the process saying these particular sets of demands here, these are the hegemo hegemonic ones. And we need to agree on this, otherwise we won't move forward, right? So one of the really big challenges here uh, is understanding that um, convergence, convergence is where things meet, is not where we begin from, right? It's where we end up. 
So it's part of a process of building together and trying to find these synergies. And I think this is another uh, term that's very interesting uh, to use when we're talking about activism, um, because like in organized struggles, um, the search for synergies is very important because it's, it's a way of expanding our alliances. So, uh, you know, our, our field of solidarity with other people, finding in terms of like what what's going on in one place and how their struggle was successful. Can we do something like that here? So sharing knowledge. Um, this often leads to internationalist politics because it means that movements need to talk to movements in many other areas. So in a way, um, they confront some of these like state-based uh, strategies um, that are just about contesting the state in one area because movements find out that, for example, one, a sacrifice zone in Australia is actually uh, very uh, similar to a sacrifice zone in Brazil, even though we're talking about countries that are in different positions within the international political economy, right? But the, pro, the colonial process was different, structured things in different, in different ways, but uh, the struggle on the ground uh, in terms of the people who have been marginalized and racialized and excluded uh, in the process, those struggles will, will be very similar, right? So the convergence would is something that helps us in terms of like finding the similarities and sharing and then learning from it and not necessarily uh, hegemonizing, right? And saying that this is going to be the process and coming from a um, like a top-down perspective. And there's a discussion from like a more, more theoretical discussion here in terms of feminist politics coming uh, from Julieta Paredes in Bolivia that I think is quite interesting in terms of uh, feminism comunitario, right? So like, a, like com communal uh, or communitarian feminism, sometimes uh, in, in English it gets translated uh, in, in both ways, right? But one of the things that, 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 that Julieta usually discusses in this is that um, the, the proposal behind uh, Feminismo Comunitario is to sometimes challenge uh, like intellectual academic colonialism that uh, works through like feminist perspective sometimes. And what she has like even calls like traditional feminism, right? So like this feminism that sometimes is so worried about what are the struggles that unite us all and you end up having like a hierarchy in the end of it because you're not challenging the power struggles and um, and the hierarchies within the, the women's movement itself. So like how like women in academia have a perspective and maybe women on the ground in the community like defending uh, the river, defending the land may have a different perspective. So it's very interesting how she does this because she says that uh, feminism communitario is a uh, uh, feminism that contemplates uh, both uh, multicultural scenarios, but also plurinationality. And I think this is quite relevant to the context of Bolivia. Uh, like uh, Julieta Paredes is an Aymara lesbian woman, like founder of a very relevant uh, women's organizations uh, in the country that influenced the process uh, for like women to have more of a role um, uh, under the Morales government. So there, there, there's a lot of like this development around uh, uh, feminism communitario is very much part of like the struggle of trying to build an alternative. Um, but knowing that, you know, a movement that led to like the first indigenous president and everything was still a movement that was very patriarchal. So having to challenge that. And one of the things that I find that's very interesting here, and this informs a lot of my research in terms of climate change, is that uh, when she talks about like communitarian feminism, it's about the roles that people play in society. And like, what are the roles in the community? And what are the things that we can rearrange in the community that will uh, teach us by doing that things can be in a different way? What are the alternatives that may arise from that? And this is quite relevant in the sense of what we call care democracy, because at the same time that we're challenging the, you know, double, you know, like the, how women have like a um, double work week and like uh, working a lot more or that uh, in terms of like this expectation that the care of children and the elderly and people with disabilities and so forth will be uh, placed on women. Um, 
when we talk about like like uh, changing the roles in society, it's not just a matter the way that she puts it in in like okay, so men will have will have to carry more of the burden, but it's also a how how can we do things in a more collective way rather than just say than just saying that well the responsibility is this person and this person and this person. Uh, some of this connected to child rearing is quite important when you understand that. Um, raising children should not be the job of just one person or that one uh, nucleus of a family, but the community itself, because children will grow in the territory. And that's, uh, you know, the growth of a child is also territorial making. So in that way, all the people need to assume responsibility. So now we have to, for example, reorganize the actual physical space. So where do, like uh, can we have more places to play together and then we can we have more places so maybe we can do laundry together or and we can take turns in terms of uh you know kitchen work because that would be more efficient and then you can have different knowledges and and skills coming together creating uh productive synergies here that will free up the time of women but also men uh like in the in the process and this Part of a care democracy is quite important to us talking in terms of climate change transition, because this is usually very low carbon economies. So like it's a low carbon practices within the communities that uh, raise standard of living that help with like with how people perceive what, what a good life looks like. And that goes back to the discussion in Latin America around, you know, when we like very, very common uh, in the case of, of Bolivia itself, but in Brazil talking about being vivid and and so on. And these helps us like challenge the traditional feminism itself that when was being imported, it was about this idea that, well, women now need to take like particular roles in society as like very strong and working in like in the out, uh, outside external workforce and maybe become CEOs and things like that. So in one, in one way or another, um, this communitarian feminism um, and uh, Julieta talks about it like it's very re revolutionary in the sense that we need to reorganize communities in things that sometimes are so basic, like a, a, a communal kitchen is something so basic. Um, it doesn't take a lot of work to actually like get it done, but it restructures time in such a way that the roles all around it will change as well. And, and then you, you end up having a change of men mentality uh, in the process. And I, th and I find that's interesting because that goes back to the initial point, right? Once you do that, then you find that electricity, because, well, I, this community kitchen should be electrified. So you have a dish of electricity and renewables and how um, you're so close to it, you might want to know where your power comes from. And then you are spending more time together. So this helps with the bonds of solidarity. Um, it helps you free up time. So we have more time for organizing because a lot of the women are exhausted and can't organize because they're carrying too much of the burden. And then you get like the convergence in a very natural process. So it's not the demand that you're imposing that we need to converge here. But if we reorganize the communities, these convergences, they like they pop up by themselves. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Uh, we already have a conversation, right? Uh, and I wanted to, to hand over to um, Camila. Please, it's your turn to answer this question, to comment uh, on the previous one. Yeah, yeah thank, you, thank you again. It was super interesting, all the comments. Um, of course, I, I, I'm really related to the, the things that uh, Janet, for example, just said about uh, listening to the woman, and not just the woman, all the activists in general. Um, in my career, I also try to do that at the very beginning, right? Um, and of course, I have not just been working about uh, feminism, uh, but also about uh, students um, in general, right? Uh, student movements. So, but of course, we have to choose in a moment. We don't, we cannot just take everything. Um, of course, we can we can take it, but we have to make decisions uh, when we we start doing our research. So. In my case, in the moment that I, I, I moved to the, to the feminist, I, of course, I, I was more connected with the post-colonial post theories, uh, for example, in the case of François Vergés, uh, Rita Sigato from Argentina, who is also connected with the eco, um, 
all the all the troubles uh, regarding to the na nature, and and of course it's of course this is in in dialogue with other theories, uh, the intersectional feminism, of course the eco feminist as uh, was mentioned for uh, by Sabrina as well. So um, of course I want to in my research I have been working it's, it's also related to social justice, but not really social, not just so social justice and. And environmental, because I use other terms, uh, for example, subjectivity, socialization, extractivism, as I said before. So in my case, for example, the subjectivities are, are key, uh, the key for understanding and to, to clarify how these actors, they build themselves, right? Um, uh, and they, they are able to become an actor because they need to have an experience at the beginning. They need to, to live, to, to experience the, the, the protest, uh, the struggles, or, or wherever we are looking for, right? So um, this is very important and, and allows us to understand how the activists create and interpret their reality, right? Uh, so yeah, this is, is a point. But also, for example, um, in this case, for example, how these students that I was talking at the beginning, they became uh, feminists, right? This is also important. We, that's why I use the term, the, the, the concept of, um, of subjectivity, also socialization, right? It's also very important to understand this process. Uh, also, for example, another example very, very um, important in Chile, it's the, the case of Las Tesis. I don't know if you, you know it a little bit, but uh, they create a song that became the manifest of feminists around the world, around the, not, not all the feminists, of course, but uh, more related to the, the young feminists. Uh, so, um, and also they were doing performance all around the world. Uh, also, all people, the, the seniors all, as well. So it was very interesting how they, they became uh, uh, something, someone, very, uh, um, they had a role very important in the in these movements, uh, and also it's not just a performance that were they were doing. It's also they were also connected with the theory. For example, they were using theories, for example, elements of from from Rita Segato, um, Federici, so uh, many others. That's, and for me, this is very important, right? Because we just we there are not just activists, they are also, for example, professionals that they, they work with um, other tools so they can really change something. And this is uh, an important point. Um, so yeah, the, for me, the, these two concept, concepts like subjectivities that are important because they are also changing all the time, they are transforming the actors and also the movements and also the socialization because it's it happens at the very beginning of a person, right? In the childhood or maybe in the, in the youth. So also it's gonna mark the, in, in, in the actors, the, the, the people itself. Um, and of course, the concept of, of extractivism uh, was developed by Gudinas in Uruguay or Maris, Maristela Svampa. Also it's very, very relevant. And for me, it's much more important than just talk about environmental troubles or struggles. Right, because it refers, um, ha, as um, Sabrina said before, right, it refers um, to a problem of inequalities north south. We can have the same trouble, the same problem in 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 Uganda or in in Tunisia, uh, and also in in Chile, Peru, Bolivia, right. So we have the same troubles at the same time. Um, it's how we think the um, development, right? Uh, how we think the problems, the inequalities, how we try to solve the problems, how we think uh, the development of our countries in Latin America, in the global South in general. So this is also very, it's, it's a, a deep point to, to think about. Um, of course, this concept is not just extraction of raw materials, it's also a a model itself. This is this is for me. This is is not just the extraction, right? It's not just a, a struggle in a, in a in a location in a in a region, right? It's it's a how it's how they think this situation itself. 
So, um, because many countries, for example, as I said before, they're, they're, they have based their economies in these uh, materials. For example, the case of the Persian Gulf or Venezuela, um, with the petrol, of course, and the lithium, for example, right now, it's, it's, it's becoming more and more important in Bolivia and the copper, of course, in, in Chile. Uh, so, just to, to answer the question that we said before about the new Namenos and the extractivism, of course, there are many, many connections uh, that we can see today, uh, like all the time, because the actors are not just in one one place, right? This is this is this is an important point that also you said before. Uh, they are they are trying to change the world. They are moving from one one movement to the other. They are they are, they are present in different places. So, for them, how they want to change the world. They have to be. They have to be present in in these other and other places, for example. So they have to be connected. They have to work. They have to create new um, new like tools for changing this world. That's why I was talking at the beginning about the the activists. They were really doing something really interesting. For example projecting lights uh, during all this uh, estallido social, this uh, Chile Desperto movement. So we, we had these activists doing these lights all over uh, every week, every single, I mean, every day almost, also in the in the extractivist areas. They were also uh, projecting uh, no more sacrifice zones in the, in the, and the, I don't know how you call it, in the humus and the, in the, gases you know so it was very very interesting and i think we have to look more deep into these kind of um uh, actions so thanks thank you very much camila um i, I think somehow you're like the, the following question um is related to the previous one because now i want to invite you to think uh, of your position how do you position yourself in academia in relation to activism how do you as an academic relate to the social movements that you do research with or in other words how research and activism relate in your work and for me this is like not only a matter of positionality but it will have implications for uh, the kind of research we do uh, it has implications to our theoretical framework to to, to the kind of relationship that we create uh, with the activists, with the people that we are doing research with, right? Uh, so I I was also thinking of this, this question and for me it was pretty challenging also. Yeah, I, I would love to engage in the discussion as well, but I wanted to hear you first to give the floor to you. But I wanted to ask if you can try to, to answer in around five minutes so if some if uh, someone um, if anyone in the uh, who is attending wanted to ask uh, a question, please write down your chat now that I will uh, read it afterwards, and then we can have like a final round in which you can like close, uh, say some final words. But like we have around thirty minutes, so maybe five minutes each now, and then we have more or less five minutes to close. So I will start now with Sabrina, uh, please. Yes, well, one of the, one of the things about not uh, working with very specific groups, but with how the groups interact themselves is that I usually find that when I'm researching, I'm also researching what I'm doing as well with all of them, right? Like as an activist within the climate just movement, uh, justice movement, um, as an eco-socialist organizer, I end up having to deal with them um, in my my daily activities at the, uh, at the end of this. Um, also, because a lot of my work uh, connected to um, political communication, it also intersects with my work on research dissemination. Um, what's interesting here is that from the beginning, like way back in my undergraduate uh, time, when I started doing research with uh, ecological movements, I already uh, started reading a lot about research activism and both the um, ethical components of, of this, the methodological conflicts, but more than anything else is mo motivation. Like why study what you study? And um, for me, it was very hard to 
um, answer the question, like why study uh, what I'm studying if I wasn't answering well, well because I care, because I care. And if I care, I probably am going to do something about it. Uh, sometimes it means that our research ends up producing things, or like we have these products that are very much uh, um, aligned with something that can help movements with their strategies. Uh, but sometimes they're not that relevant for like particular times of the struggle, but they're building a body of knowledge that can add to something later on. So one of the things that I think is very important for, for us, like who, who do research uh, and care at the same time uh, for what we're, what we're researching is not to have too much of an utilitarian approach to it. Um, because you might end up thinking that, well, I need to do something because it's going to serve this one particular time of it, because you just end up being like, you know, a service provider and being a service provider alters your relationships with the movement. And uh, it, it might even um, have a negative, negative effect on how much you care and how you care for it. Right? So we have this job of having to like, of, of self reflexivity all the time of like understanding that we're actually putting different hats on at the same time. And sometimes you're wearing two, three hats. Sometimes you need to take one off and just like take a step back and then change hats a little. So it's really this game of adaptation that we do all the time uh, um, in terms of uh, research activism itself. And it might affect, yes, like some of the methodologies, but something that I found that it's always been very helpful is to be very honest, upfront, public about this. And when we're writing about it, when we're in the, the process of dissemination, being very upfront about it is actually a way of like giving uh, visibility to other layers of organizing and intellectual work within the movements that will help us break uh, some of this um, stereotypical view um, that we find sometimes that well, knowledge creation is like intellectual work in academia, and then those people are doing practice, right? But at, actually, the very reality is everything is, well, at least in the movements, there's a lot of intellectual work all of the time. It's not something that separates, we're not bringing a gift to them or like, or someone's being appointed to do this. The, the activity is a practical intellectual activity, right? So there's something that Paulo Freire referred to as praxis, something that Marx talked about, like in the third thesis on Feuerbach, right? So like this coincidence of practical um, uh, theoretical activity itself. Um, so that's very, very important. And then we do that, it serves as a way of like confronting something that we actually do lack in academia sometimes, which is the fact that thinking that if we're doing science, we only have to do the intellectual part of it, otherwise it won't be scientific enough, right? So like the understanding of science as engaged science is very important because uh, considering what's at stake today, like the sum of so many crises right now, um, engaged science is the only kind of science that might actually allow us to have science in the future. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a matter of survival and it's a matter of survival in terms of life and in terms of uh, our own um, intellectual pursuits as well. So the, this type of conversation is quite important. And I find that in my particular work, like in my field um, related to climate change, I've had to be very um, upfront and sometimes um, even like get into a little bit of conflict within the, you know, the climate science community, because sometimes it's found that you're a climate scientist, if you're, you know, actually measuring the amount of emissions going to the atmosphere. The other people are like social scientists who do things related to climate change. So having to, you know, be very upfront and say, you know, like, the the type of work that we do that this is also climate science because you could be giving like a lot of diagnostics on things but we're also giving diagnostics this is for example the difference between um conceptualizing the geological era that we might be in as the anthropocene and getting that concept and understanding that well is the human epoch but it's not for any type of human and the responsibilities are not shared in the same way and what's at stake is also very unequal and you need social science for that and social science will have to be engaged 
social science, if you will be able to actually come up with these pieces of the, the, the diagnosis that will help us qualify things further, get to the root of the problem, and then create solutions that will bring us forward because there will be like literally radical because they came from the root of it. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Very <laughs> inspiring uh, insights. I just wanted to add, I will, uh, the next one to speak is Camila and then Janet. But like we got a, a question from Rosie Kerr in our chat and it's related to this question. So uh, the question is, I would add to Marco's question, I think it should be interesting to hear about class differences and any tensions that you encounter. So maybe Camila and uh, Janet can address it and Sabrina have a chance to, to speak later again. Camila, it's your turn. Yes, uh, thank you. So yeah, it's a very difficult question. I have been struggling a, a, a lot when I was younger and I still, I still been a, a, a thing and that sometimes bother me a little bit because sometimes you can see this uh, difference between colleagues that who is the most engaged, who is less engaged, who is more activist, you know, for, for in both sides, like uh, something wrong and something bad. And, and of course, we cannot be objective, objective at all. Social science is, uh, and the objectivity is an illusion, I think. Um, and today, um, this afternoon, we're not going to talk about this ontological or epistemic things, right? Uh, we're not going to talk about deep inside of these uh, elements. But of course, as a researcher, we have to take a position. We have to be clear about what, why we are studying this thing or this other, right? This uh, movement or, or, or this activist. Um, so it's important to recognize uh, our is history and how we see the connections and the interconnection between that what we are studying, I think in my case, for me, it was important to, to, for example, to be an activist when I was younger, when I was at the university. And also later, I was very, very, for me, it was very important also the extractivist situation in my country. So that was something very relevant in my, in my, my career. So um, also we need to identify ourselves as activists. Also, we have to, uh, to, to decide what is going to be the position that we have in this in these um, movements, of course. Uh, so how do we want to help them? Um, um, so what is going to be the position that we're going to take? So um, of course we have we have a crucial role to make this injustice uh, visible for everyone, right? Um, because most of the time the media they don't say all the things that are, that are happening happening. Uh, we have to give the, the voice to those that they don't have uh, the, the, the place to talk uh, in the media or in other, other spaces, right? Um, so um, it's important to spread this, this message for, for me. And also um, to say what is relevant, right? This, when, we, when we teach, there are so many things that we can choose about theory we were talking before. It's also very, we have a role in their lives um, and the students. So we have to, 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 to choose what we're going to teach to them and how we're, we're going to show this information. So, we, for example, what um, movement is important and what is not that important, we have to make decisions as academic um, in the academia. So um, we have to be aware about the, this information the authors that we were choosing and also try to include all voices, right? This is also a, an important point. Um, also, we have we, we have this this role in the new generations uh, because they have also to, to, to have an important role themselves, uh, a leading role for their own education. If we don't, we just try to be in the position of superiority, we're not going to change anything at all. So for me, this is very important as well to, to learn from the, from the students and from the activists, because I'm not going to teach them how to do the things. They have also to teach me how to, to understand um, the different problematics that we are, we're going to, they're going to, they are living in this moment. So um, in my case, also it's important. We have also a role uh, in, in, of course, in Latin America, because we are, 
we have um, living many changes in this moment. For example, in Chile, you said before the new constitutions, all the turn, the new turn to the left in Latin America, what we are supposed to have, but uh, we have, we cannot just say this is this is a turn to the left. We have to say much more. For example, in my case, I'm working about extractivism, so for me, it's important to say that we have to check all the information. We have to say to to, to check if these changes are really the, re the the good changes that we are expecting for or, or not. Right? If this is. Um, um, a president, a really green president or not, for example. This is our, I think that we, most of the people working on this position, they don't want to really talk about because it's sometimes it's problematic, but we have to really try to have this conversation. So yeah, for me, it's more or less this. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Camila. Um, Janet, the floor is yours. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I just, uh, I think I'm going to echo what others have said in a lot of ways, but I think like um, Sabrina said about about uh, studying things because we care, you know, or <laughs> the question about engaged uh, scholarship or activist scholarship. I mean, I would say about myself that I've been driven by the political questions of uh, progressive social movements. And uh, the questions that they that they present, the questions that they are asking, and the questions that are thrown up by their their practices, which include their contradictory practices. Um, but that I'm that's what motivates me. That's what drives me. And it's also um, you know to date it's because I on some level identify with their agendas and I'm invested in their um, in their development. You know, and I've identified with them in, in various ways. Um, and as I said earlier, that I would say that my um, academic practice seeks to be dialogical with the questions and knowledges of those movements. So, um, you know, that's how I would sort of position the relationship between academic work and, and activism. Um, however, I would also say that over the course of my, again, uh, academic career, quote unquote, um, I've had different relations to the different activisms I've studied. And for different reasons, I mean, partly in some cases, I was a full on full blast, fully engaged full time activist and then was documenting the practice and then writing about the practice. And that's a different positionality, you know, than one that is more part time or more episodic. Um, in the case of the World Social Forum, you know, I considered myself uh, an activist in the anti globalization movement. And I was actively engaged in organizing and convening the Toronto Social Forum. So I was a practitioner at the same time as I was studying a process that was much bigger than my own practice, but engaged again in a dialogical way as a practitioner and as a knowledge producer in that in that movement and trying to also theorize it and, and document it and theorize it um, for meaning beyond the obvious, perhaps, you know. Um, in terms of just going back to something that Sabrina said, and, and I really agree with this in that uh, to me, there's, there have been um, kind of constant tensions between serving the movement and um, finding my own voice, you know, with respect to the movement and what I want to say about it. And um, that I have really consistently tried to figure out how, uh, especially as, you know, I've gotten older and for reasons of aging <laughs> and energy and everything, but um, you know, not having that same kind of activist uh, cr credibility, um, seeking as a researcher to find some way to serve the movement, to document it in its own terms, to do something that is useful, but also um, trying to figure out how to maintain some kind of space for my own critical questions and to produce critical knowledge that's not simply um, a self representation of the movement, you know, and there's all kinds of tensions in that um, questions, you know, tensions of representation and, and tensions around critique um, of movements that um, in general, you know, we want to promote and endorse and, and see succeed in their own terms. Um, over the years, I would say that I, my own practice has, has, you know, been the whole run, the whole kind of gamut from full time embedded to much more uh, episodic. 
and um, and also as I think my capacities as a researcher and as an academic have grown, I've become more able to ask bigger questions, more complicated questions that are not narrowly the questions of the movements themselves, but are questions that I consider important for the larger political discussion that we're involved in as academics. But you know there are tensions around that. And then um, maybe the last big thing I'd say is that my positionality has, has is definitely different vis-a-vis -vis different kinds of movements. And that, uh, for example, in my engagements with Indigenous movements and Indigenous women's movements, um, I am clearly a white ally. You know, I'm not in the movement. I'm not seeking to represent it in any kind of uh, authoritative way. It's really, in that sense, trying to find a way to serve it. You know, and that's in that sense, I think that the question about serving the movement is a different one than it is for other kinds of movements I've been part of. So I think the question shifts, you know, with our own who we are ourselves and what we bring, and also our relationship with the movement itself. Um, the you know, in terms of the whole question about um, activism and, and engagement, what I've come to think about this is that, you know, it's not um, possible and not even necessarily desirable for all kinds of social movement scholarship to be activist scholarship. Um, however, some significant experience of activist practice is a source of irreducible insight that cannot come through any other channel. So I would say to any person who is seeking to study movements in the ways we're talking about, that at some point, you know, some significant engagement as an activist gives you some kind of real insight into the workings of movements and the dynamics inside movements that it's not really possible to get otherwise. And I would say that without saying that we all have to do everything all the time, you know. Um, and then maybe the last point I'd make in closing is that, um, you know, I'm in the middle of um, developing a new research agenda, which is on the gender politics of the resurgent right. And uh, this is confronting me with a whole set of new questions about engagement <laughs> and, and positionality, because now I'm studying movements that I think are the enemy. You know, that these are movements that scare me, that frighten me, um, that uh, I, I am looking to figure out how to contribute to opposing them. And that's a different positionality and, you know, will be a different kind of conversation. Um, but anyway, I just want to sort of just say that, you know, that movements come in all uh, shapes and sizes and uh, orientations and that we always make political judgments, you know, about our, our political relationship to those movements, uh, and that it's also important to study movements with, with which we do not identify. And that raises different kinds of questions about um, positionality. Thank you very much, Janice. I was thinking and I was almost uh, forgetting that's my, my role to moderate. Um, uh, because it is your last point was the, the, one of the questions that I was raising in my mind, like, what do we do when we engage with the movements that are considered like we, which, with which we don't have any kind of, um, we don't engage with, the, with their ideas, we don't, co we don't share their beliefs. So I think it's, it's going to be an exciting research agenda that you is going to start and I'm looking forward to hear your insights. Um, but, uh, but it brings me like we have a few more minutes and I would like, I would, I would love to also to, to talk about that by about my own positionality. I don't, I not only do research with feminists and women's movements, but I do also. And of course, my role as a man among the women is like something that's not as usual uh, as it should be anyway. And it also brings me many challenges, but I, I, I just wanted to address that to, to say like, uh, I would love to, to continue this conversation with you, but I wanted to give you the chance to some final words. And I was also thinking here, we were talking about uh, during the last almost two hours, indigenous movements, they were very present in our discussion, climate change, uh, 
food crisis idea it's a main topic nowadays everyone is talking about that like with the war in ukraine and the fear of food scarcity it became a topic to a few parts of the world like for, I, i like to say that for many parts of the world the food crisis was uh, was there we were facing this uh, crisis in many parts but now it's somehow here as well in the so-called global north we also have the, those anti-feminist anti-gender authoritarian movements So I'm just trying to 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 point out those topics or those dimensions to, and I'm thinking I'm wondering how does it affects our research our research agenda our uh methodologies how uh, it's it feels like I don't want to say this is a new world somehow but we have some new challenges so maybe I just wanted to um to point it out and maybe to give you the chance to react to that or to say uh, your final words like just I know that's like a broad question but like just I, I don't want to to close the discussion here but like just uh, continue the conversation with you and maybe it's three minutes for for each of you uh, who wants to start now I don't <laughs> Sabrina great thank you <laughs> I can go because uh, you were saying that I, I started thinking of something, but um, in a in a sense, uh, working like with a feminist perspective and movements that engage directly with feminism or around feminism in some way um, shows us that well, feminist perspectives help us organize priorities, right? So you were talking about a lot of these crises, and and when we work within. Uh, you know, like talking about food justice, talking about the need for a paradigm uh, that's like for real food sovereignty in the world. Um, for me, that's like a, a, one of the highest priorities we should have. Like it's it's very direct, and the feminist perspectives around it, like they come forth because because usually women's organizations and women's demands are around things that are like direct priorities, and sometimes you can't. Uh, waste uh, time that sometimes is wasted in other movements within progressive and anti-capitalist channels because people are very much in a rush and in other places sometimes you're just going around and you know uh, thinking that we can afford the luxury of fragmentation of sectarianism of um, establishing and reestablishing traditional hierarchies within the movements But when you're talking, for example, around abortion rights, you're talking that they're being taken away um, at a very fast pace right now and uh, uh, being slowed down in other parts of the world as well. And we're talking about the issue of like food insecurity around the world and with the extreme weather events, for example, this huge heat wave uh, that's going on in, in parts of the global north and, and, and uh, South Asia right now, we see that, well, uh, we need to adjust things for yesterday, yesterday, and that brings forth perhaps a conversation around sea democracy that comes from ecofeminists, that comes from peasant women that have been engaged in trying to secure uh, proper seeds that can withstand um, not just the most extreme weather events coming from climate change, but, you know, withstand like uh, the, 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 the time itself, right, in the sense of like, this is our culinary culture, this is what we eat, this is how we are connected to the land. Um, and so uh, organizing these priorities is very important for us. And I think this is something that we should always be reflecting on, not only as researchers, but also as people who are engaged um, in the movements and in our conversations, because it's uh, usually something that um, uh, should be obvious, right? Like, well, like what are the things that um, apply to our like survival? directly today apply to basic human dignity apply to bodily autonomy these things should be quite obvious but we also have the need to remind ourselves and remind our other people uh, of this all of the time because we're dealing with too many things we are dealing with too many things and the interesting thing about organizing priorities is that they're they're not a way of excluding the other things is that usually things are the priorities they they create the fundamentals of how we organize, right? So if we have, like going back to the issue of food, because well, it, it, it is quite uh, part of how, how we connect here too, but 
once you're organizing around food or like food sovereignty you are organizing around land and territory you are organizing around around opposition to you know the the class uh, structures in society in terms of agribusiness, financial markets, and commodities. You are organizing around climate change because you need to understand how you are um, uh, how you are actually uh, going to deal with these events. And you are organizing around bodily autonomy because it requires for you to understand health issues and how like women usually would eat less if it means that the other people in the family will get to eat first. So it, when you organize priorities, you actually organize the fundamentals that will help us deal with all of the other things as well. So this is something that's useful usually, yeah. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Um, I would like to, uh, to give the floor to Camila, to your last words, to final words. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I agree also with the comments. Um, uh, totally agree with um, Sabrina. Um, yeah, in my case, I have been working in Maghreb, Latin America, so the situation is uh, more problematic, right? Not, I mean, the, um, we have even more problems after COVID and uh, with the war, the food insecurity was even before. So um, because of the pollution, uh, because of the extractivism, I mean, the water, the land was already uh, polluated. So, I mean, we, we have to work on this, uh, these problems. That's why, uh, for example, uh, right now we need to have a new constitution. This is very important for, for our country. So, um, as, as, uh, Sabrina was saying, we have, we, of course, we have priorities. Uh, we have to solve these, uh, problems before, uh, and then we, we can start with others. Um, uh, for example, the climate change. Uh, everyone is talking about climate change, but we we ha we're still having problems uh, because of the the companies, the, the industry of of the the copper, for example. Um, there are, there is a, a, a thing that the the movements used to say: um, "No es sequía, es saqueo. It's not drought, it's looting." Um, so this is very very important for for me. So. Uh, it's much more about much more than that clim climate change. It's something a, a problem that was for many many years, right? So I think we have to we have to work on this. We have to solve the situation. We have to figure it out how we are going to deal with the with the transition, the energetic transition, and also the um, uh, I mean how we are going to think uh, the countries in Latin America in general, also in Maghreb, without this. These materials, if we really have other options um, and how we can live together <laughs> without uh, making troubles in, in, in the local communities, right? So, this is, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camila. Janet, please. Well, I mean, there's there's so many interesting um, issues and questions that you know remain and that are kind of haunting our discussion. Um, but maybe I'll just say a word about the question that came up in the chat about class difference. Um, and that is that in my um, history of research, I would say that class differences, if by, so, and when I use, I'm not sure how the Rosie meant the, the category of class in her question, but um, very concretely, the big divide that I've seen in movements is around education level. And it's about um, people who can actually engage in a conversation about what's happening and what needs to be done and what can be done and what other people are doing and people who are have never had access to that kind of conversation. And, um, and that's where I think the, the question about um, the relationship of movements to subalternized populations remains a hugely important question that most movements in most places, I think, um, obscure. And they obscure that because many progressive movements assume that they speak for the majority, assume that they represent the popular or the, the people, and um, that, that relations of subalternity, I think, get obscured in that often. And so I think the, the, the question of those kinds of inequalities, uh, you know, continue to really haunt progressive politics of all kinds. 
Um, yeah, and 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 I think the 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 question about um, which is a it's a class question on one level, but then it's also a question of other worlds, and this is again the question about uh, indigenous worlds and indigenous cosmologies, and the fact that that our abilities to to talk across these worlds in a way that enables us to work in alliance with each other is still, I think, very, very underdeveloped. So, I mean, these are some of the, the challenges that I think are, you know, remain um, for many movements that we're talking about. Thank you very much, Janet. And uh, with that, um, I want to thank you, all of you, Janet, Sabrina, uh, Camila. For me, it was a very inspiring conversation. I hope you enjoy it and you had fun and you have like food for thought we will meet again we will keep um we'll keep this conversation and um before handing over to uh, sabina i also wanted to thank you uh, the margarida von betrano center for gender studies for being this incredible partner uh, sabina and i'm speaking on behalf also on behalf of renata mota who couldn't be here today but I'm sure she would be happy to 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 watch the uh, conversation that we had uh, in a few days. Thank you very much.